Yeah, I'm going to tell you a little story. He came to Columbia, South Carolina in 1999 during Ramadan. And in three days, we visited 11 prisons. This man, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, has been blessed by Allah with such love of Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and love of the Muslims that he, he gives his whole life for the advancement of Islam. So we hope that tonight you will benefit from his words. Those of you who are non-Muslim, we invite you to get your questions together because he too, like I was, was once a non-Muslim. And perhaps his answer will help you to get a little closer to understanding and accepting the truth of Islam. Sheikh Yusuf and I have traveled in many, many places around the world. We visited Mexico. We visited the island of Curacao in the Dutch Netherlands Antilles. We visited England together and all across the United Muslim. States. And it is we such an honor for me to be here with him here together. in Shanghai, India. Too, like I'm I'm so we're going to ask that you sit back, relax, put your antennas up. Turn your cell phones off, unless you're calling them to tell them to tune in to www.peacevisionofislam.in so they can hear this lecture live. Sheikh Yusuf is the founder and director of the website shareislam.com, and he is the owner of more than 4,000 websites that are giving the message of da'wah in so many, many ways. And we invite you to visit those websites and help him spread this message of Islam, peace of Allah, as we are here to help you spread Islam. So this time, we're going to ask that our beloved Sheikh Yusuf come before us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Sheikh Yusuf Estes. After that, I have to walk on water or something. <laughs> Salaam alaikum. <laughs> I just told Sheikh Mutahir that after an introduction like that, I think they expect me to walk on the water. <laughs> it is true that Sheikh Mutahir and I have been blessed by Allah in many ways not the least of which, of course, is to be guided to the truth of Islam. While traveling around the world, we come across many questions, and I hope we have some good questions from you guys tonight. But I was recalling that some years ago, right after the incident that took place on September the 11th in my country, the attack against the World Trade Center, the death of so many people, and then the accusations that were brought out against Muslims and by default against Islam. I remember a brand new Muslim, he would just come to Islam and he used to call me every day and talk with me. And he called me up one day and he said, Sheikh, I don't know what to do. I was talking to somebody that was born Muslim and I was telling him I became a Muslim and I wanted to ask him something, you know, and he just looked at me and he said, this is the worst time to be a Muslim. He said, what should I do? I told him, first of all, pray to Allah and thank Allah for guiding you and then ask Allah to guide him. And then go back to the man and tell him that we said, this is the best time to be a Muslim. The difficulties and experiences that all of us are going through these days really reflect what Allah says about the believers in the Quran itself. For those who are born as Muslims, raised as Muslims, and all they know is Islam, at some point in their life still, it's necessary for them to 
stop and think. Why am I a Muslim? Is there some other religion better than this? And then when they discover what Islam really is for themselves, they, like others who come to Islam, have to say, I believe in Allah. He's one God. And I believe in Muhammad as his messenger. And when they do, there's a promise. A promise from Allah in the Quran in chapter 29 Surah Al-Ankabur And Allah says A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Alif Lam Mim Ahasab bin Nasu An Yudluku An Yafulu Amana Do the human beings think They're going to be left alone On saying we believe And they won't be put into big fitna From Allah as Allah has put those before us in the same kind of tests and calamities to show the truthful of those that are telling the truth and expose the liars in their falsehood. Reflect with me for just a moment, brothers, sisters in Islam, brothers and sisters in humanity, and consider what was the life like for the prophets that we know about? Was it easy? Were they always treated like kings? Was everything laid out before them? Simple, nice, luxurious? Or did they suffer? What happened in the story of Moses? And I'm sure with just a little bit of thought you can realize from his birth and until his death there was a lot of difficulty and for those who really followed him they experienced these same trials and tribulations is that true or false and for all of the prophets that came and you read their stories in the Old Testament and for when prophet Jesus peace be upon him came the difficulties that they also experienced and if you know anything about Josephus and his writings of the very early days of Christianity, you'll find, again, there was a lot of suffering, trials, and tribulations. The early followers of Jesus is recorded history that they were actually thrown into the pits and thrown into the amphitheaters and made sport of while they were mutilated and even decapitated. They killed them for sport, for fun. Throughout history, we see the people who are really dedicated to this belief, one God, one message, we see them suffering. So what is new? When Prophet Muhammad Wasallam came, did his own family, the people closest to him, get excited and jump up and down and say, oh, this is a wonderful new religion. Oh, were they happy? Or did they reject it? They didn't like it. In fact, some of them abused him, and these were close relatives, abused him for nothing more than he was calling to the truth. There is a God, a real God. Not something you can put in your pocket and pull out when you need good luck. A real Lord. Someone somehow could get this concept in their mind, even today, that there really is God. And that you don't create Him in your mind, but whether He really created you in the first place. they happy? They're on this side. they and the first people that accepted Islam, they didn't they like suffered it. horrendously. In yes, fact, no. some of them abused him and his. And those who were him. the closest to Muhammad, nothing more. and they really they wanted to be close to Allah, they suffered the most. A, God, a real God. 
Do you know somebody named Bilal? And pull out when you need good luck. And what was the treatment of Bilal? He was a slave, but he'd like to be a Muslim. Muslim simply means I want to believe in God and do what he wants me to do. I want to be a good person for his sake. That's what it means. Even today, that there really is God. When he said that, his owners you don't create insisted in your mind that he has to worship these false gods because they're on this same track as Abuza. And, and the first people that accepted Islam, Uza. they <laughs> suffered <laughs> horrendously. <laughs> yeah, he rejected that. He just said, Ahad, Ahad. And those who means, were the closest to Muhammad, Muhammad. And what did they really give him as a reward for that? that? They suffered the most. They beat him yes or no? and beat him and beat him. Do you know somebody named Bilal? And then they put him down in the desert with his back to an open. And the treatment of Bilal, he was a slave. Down, down in the heart of Muslim sands. Muslim simply means I want to believe in God and what he wants me to do. I want to be a good person for his sake. It's what it means. And how many of us when you hear this story, we say, MashaAllah. His owners Mashallah. insisted this is the deen. This is the he right. has to worship these we false gods. Yeah. Yeah. Allah, there's so a reason. Somebody puts a little bit of pressure on us. You know, you got to wonder about it. God they just come by and give you a look like you're on the Muslims. And you know, he rejected oh, that. Oh, oh, he just like said, Ahad, on you. Ahad, he means uniquely one. And what did they give him as a reward for that? Think about it. They and then we talk about all our sisters suffering him. him. She shouldn't wear him. And then they put him down in the desert. desert. Well, you know, with you know, look at her one way and they'll say something and maybe she can't be down in the hot burning sands and put a huge boat. It's better to give up yes, your no. job and keep your job. And how many of us, when we hear this story, we say, MashaAllah, MashaAllah, this is the deen. This is the right. right. We know that, in yeah. word, Sumeya. But so when anybody puts a little bit of pressure on us, think about her life. What happened to her? She and her husband, Yas, and their son, Amr, accepted the belief that there's a God, a real God, and that He has ordered us to be good to our families, to our neighbors, and to serve Him instead of the false gods. Don't worship money. Don't worship what God created. Worship the Creator. They accepted that. And what was the reward Surya. they got? One word. The Quraysh tribe, the same relatives of Muhammad wasallam, took her, her husband and son and began to torture them and torture them and torture them. Yes or no? Think about her life. What happened to her? And that didn't satisfy them. She and her husband. And a cousin of Muhammad, yes. nicknamed Abu Jahan, the Muhammad. father of stupid, accepted the belief that there's a God, a real God. Can I translate it that way? And that he has ordered us, Abu Jahan, father of stupid, to be good, to our fears, fears to our neighbors. And to serve him, and not only tortured her, but killed her by jamming it into her private parts. Created worship the Creator. And she became they the accepted first. that, and what was the reward they Islam. got? The Qurayshi tribe, the same yeah. relatives of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, took her, her husband and son, and began to torture them, and torture much. them, and torture them. Yes or no? And then they tortured and slaughtered. Her husband, yes. And that Radiallahu. And then they began to torture and torture poor Amr the same way. But he couldn't take it. The pain was excruciating. He just witnessed his mother's death and his father's death, and now they were torturing him. And so when they said, renounce this, this religion, just say I don't believe in Muhammad anymore, just leave it. He finally said, okay, okay, and they let him go. But after that, he didn't sit with the Muslims. He sat off to himself. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked some companions, go over there and see why he's sitting by himself. What's the matter with it? Go ask him. They did, and he said, well, when they tortured me, I couldn't take it. And they told me to say it, and I said it. 
So they went back and they told Prophet Muhammad what he had said. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, go back again and ask him what was in his heart when he said it. So they went back again and they said, what was in your heart? Prophet Sallallahu wanted to know. And he said, my heart didn't waver at all from La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. They went back and they told Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi what he had said. And Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said, go back again and tell him, if they do that to you again, say the same thing again. Who here today wouldn't be proud? Wouldn't you be proud just to tie the shoes, to tie the shoes of the father or the mother of Amr ibn Yasser? You call yourself a Muslim. You call yourself a believer. Yet you look to the Quran itself and then Allah tells you and warns you. Oh, you believe? Guard yourselves and your families against the fire. The fuel is men and stones. Allah tells you in the Quran that this life is a test clearly tells you this life is only a test and he will test you with the things you love the most your position your wealth your family all of these things are going to be a test most of us we consider it a test only when we don't have what we want don't we the test is when when I don't get what I want, I need a bigger house. Huh? I want more money. I need a better education. I want to get a beautiful wife. <laughs> but when we get the things that we want, what do we do about it? How many of you, you memorize Circle Fudger? Raise your hand. If you know Circle Fudger, raise your hand. Come on, don't be shy. Or put it this way. If you could catch me in mistake in Surah Fajr, raise your hand. There you go. All right. It's in this surah that I first saw it, in this chapter called the morning. Allah tells us that whenever he tests the human being by giving them his favors, and he gives them from his generosity, the things of this world as a test. They say, my Lord has honored me. Akraman. But whenever Allah tests them by taking away from their rizqahu, from their daily bread, puts them into it a little bit in this life, then look what happens. They say, my Lord has disgraced me, dishonored me. And what does Allah say right after that? Kalla balla tukrimun yatim. Wala tahaduna ala ta'amil miskin. Allah is telling us clearly in Quran, no way, Jose, that's Texas translation, no way. The real reason is because you fail to take care of the yatim, the orphans, and you fail to take care of the poor and the indigent in their day of need. Oh no. It's not Allah, you did it to yourself. You look around and you say, oh, the condition of the Muslims today, oh, it looks like Islam doesn't work. Look, we're over here with this problem and over there with that problem. You know, and in this country and in that country and those people and these people, everybody's picking on the Muslims. Do you say it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But where is it really coming from? The prophet Jonah, Yunus, told us, he told us real clear when he made his dua to Allah in the whale, in the bottom of the sea. 
After how many days? You look and around nights. and you say, oh, the condition of the Muslims said, today. Oh, la it looks like Islam la doesn't la work. Look, we're I'm over here with this problem. Me. And over there with that all problem. All of the praise and thanksgiving is And in this country and in that country and all the worship. You know, everything is picking on the Muslims. But for sure, it's a wrong doing. I did it to myself. But where is this where is he coming said, from? Allah took him out of the whale and put him back the prophet, in the land. Is that Yunus told us. He told me it's real clear when he made his du'a <laughs> to Allah. Hell, isn't it? In the whale. Why are we in the condition we're in around the world? 1.7 Muslims in the world then, growing said, rapidly every day. La ilaha illa what if you put all of us in together? All of the praise and thanksgiving is due to you are on the porch. And all the worship, you know, because everything is for Allah. The glory is for Allah. But for sure, Allah, the wrong doing, Sheikh I Salam, did it. Um, Allah me said a few minutes ago, when he was and talking about the that, imam, Allah took him out of the whale and put him back If we had the imam, we always talk about that, yep. the imam, the faith. You know, the faith going up and down. Yep. And he mentioned the beautiful Hadith of Rasul Sallallahu that if you could hold the faith <laughs> with you, the story that we have right with the Prophet Sallallahu why are we in the world around, around, around the world? 1.7 angels are walking and shaking by the hands in the world and growing rapidly every so day. So it's true that we fall down sometimes. Yet if you put all of us but together, overall, the only problem we really have I don't is think not about Islam not working in this same church. No. Oh, this millennium is the land of the Iman. The real problem we have is not Allah, about Islam at all. Sheikh Salomon, um, the real Allah problem is about the Muslims who claim to when he was talking about the Iman. Yes. Oh, no. That if we had the Iman, we always talk about that. What did the Iman tell us in the Quran? You know, the faith going up and down. Never changes the, the tradition of the people. That if you could hold the faith the with you, that you would have Islam. while you were with Islam. Prophet Sallallahu and who here today with that, is ready for a change? Let me see your hands. Angels would walk up and change you by the hands. <laughs> ready to change themselves so and say, you know what? I'm tired of this. I'm ready to make a big change. I want to stop worshiping other than Allah. And that's really where it comes from. When you're worried and scared of something Allah created, this is not a good sign. When you're turning to the things that Allah created and hoping for your risk to come from that, it's a bad sign. The one who created you in the first place is the only one that can help you. He's the only one that can raise you up and he's the only one that can protect you. I learned that when I entered into Islam. And it's never been different than that. For 17 years I've seen the same thing over and over again. If I trust Allah, Everything works out fine. It's only when I start listening to the shaitan, the devils, who try to get me afraid of something, try to get me to look, oh, you need this, you've got to do that, turn to this, or oh, let's look at uh, modern day science is saying this or that, psychiatry is telling me so and so, I'm finding out from counseling that you get this or that, or the new health, the latest health thing, we need to look at that. But Allah sent complete and total deen with us, what, 1400 years ago? 1400 years ago. Is it true? Did Allah say He gave us complete deen? Did He say that He sent it down, completed, and it's a favor for us? Yes or no? Nitmati. <laughs> Big favor of Allah, not my of Allah. We're ready to look in Islam again. Allah said on this day, have I perfected for you your way of life, conferred my biggest favor on you, and chose for you to submit in peace in Islam. Islam always worked. It worked for Adam, Abraham, Moses, David, Suleiman, Jesus, and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and their followers and it will work for you and I today. But there's a condition. And Allah tells us this condition in the beginning of the Quran when he says, Alif la meem, dhalika kitabu la rayba fi khudili muttaqin. You've got to have taqwa, brothers and sisters. You've got to have that taqwa for Allah. 
and you have to believe in al ghaib establish salah, pay the zakah. Believe in what's sent down to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Quran, and what was sent down before. Then and only then will you be on the hidayah, the guidance of Allah. Then and only then will you be successful. In closing, I just want to say, I'm so happy Allah guided me. I'm so happy that Allah guided my father, and guided my wife, and guided my children, and brought our family. And some of the priests and ministers that I knew who also entered into Islam. I'm happy for that. And I'm especially happy for the 1.7 billion brothers and sisters that Allah gave me in return for this. Alhamdulillah. And I pray for you and me and for all the people to be rightly guided. To see the truth and the beauty of Islam in today's world. Ameen. Jazakumullah khair. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Jazakumullah khairin ya shaykh. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. May Allah give you azur wa tawfiq fi dunya wal akhir. Ameen. At this time, we are going to allow for questions and answers. And as you know, we have some guidelines to help the process along. We would like to give the non-Muslims in our audience first preference. And if you would, ask the volunteers to assist you. We have three mics located for the questions, two for the brothers to my left, and then one for the sisters. As regards to the limits on the questions, for the non-Muslims, you may ask whatever you like, inshallah ta'ala. And don't feel intimidated in any way. The Shaykh, I've known him long enough to let you know that he will not be offended by any question that you may ask. For the Muslims, we ask that you keep your questions limited to only the topic tonight, and that each Muslim would only ask one question so that others will have the opportunity as well. We ask kindly that you refrain from asking any fiqh or current event questions. Refer those to your local imams, your local mashayikh. When you come before the mic, please state your name and your occupation when called upon. And then, if you have a second question, we ask that you go to the end of the line to let the next person have the opportunity to ask. Please keep your questions brief and to the point. No commentary or lectures around your questions. And if you have written questions, those questions will be given second priority. So at this time, if we have anyone who would like to ask any questions of the Shaykh, please feel free to come before the, uh, before us here at the mic. We have one brother here in the first mic. If you would please, brother, state your name and your occupation. My name is Habib, working in information technology. I have one of my friends asking, I understand that life is a test. Why should this test be there? I have never asked God to test me. God has created the good and bad and he is, without his permission, I cannot do the bad deeds. Then how can he call it as a test and why doesn't he guide or why doesn't he send angels to correct everybody and everybody to go on the right path? Why this test is there first of all? I have now never asked the test. So he's, if he is asking like that, what is the best answer to give to him? Okay, if I understand you correctly, brother, you are asking why does God test the human beings? Yes. Why, why this test? I have never asked the test. Yes. He has created everything and he has created the luxury, he has created the money, he has created the, created the materialistic life and I am just enjoying my life. And So why do you have to be tested? Yeah. Okay. Bismillah, alhamdulillah. First of all, we thank you for a good question. <laughs> I, <laughs> I have to laugh because only one hour before this program, I was answering email in the other, in a room we have set up over there. And that question came in the email. And I didn't feel like answering it, so I just sent them to one of our websites. But I can't get away with it twice in the same day. Allah wants me to deal with the question, so i got to answer it. It's funny. All right. Why did Allah create us at all? And only Allah knows the answer to that, doesn't he? Why did Allah create? It's up to him, isn't it? 
Why did Allah create a universe with the round spheres turning in orbits that he describes clearly in the Quran long before we had telescopes? Why did Allah create everything from these little molecules and atoms, which he also describes in the Quran long before we had microscopes? And we can't answer that one either. And why did Allah make you like you are, me like I am, and all of us like we are? Why? And again, Allah knows best. But why the test? Let me share with you a few things and see if this helps you to understand better. One of the things that Allah tells us clearly in the Quran is your purpose. He says, وَمَا خَلَقْتَ الْجِنُ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبَدُونَ I have not created the jinn and mankind except for worship. So we find immediately we have a purpose. And all human beings worship. Even atheists are worshiping, whether they know it or not. Because worship really is what you're in love with. It's what you chase after. It's what you believe. It's what's part and parcel of you. That's your ibadah. You can say, for instance, that you're a Muslim. But if you don't pray five times a day, you don't fast Ramadan, you don't do Hajj and don't pay zakah, how are you a Muslim? Right? And if somebody said he's a Christian, but he doesn't go to church and he breaks all the commandments, he's not a Christian, is he? Not really. He's just given lip service. And we see that in people. But Allah has created all of us in this test. And each of us is born and each of us will die. And there's no exception to that. Allah said in the Quran, Kulu nafsan Every soul shall taste death. I have the same question as you, even after entering into Islam, until I heard one of our teachers explain a hadith of Muhammad sallallahu He said that Allah had created the paradise, He created the hellfire. And then he created the inhabitants for both places. And he could have just sent them to their respective places on the spot. But those who went to paradise might say, Ah, I deserve this. Huh? And then of course those who went to hellfire would say, Hey, what did I do to deserve this? So by going through this little test thing called life, Hayat the dunya you don't have any excuse on the day of judgment. In fact, every single human being that was ever born does not deserve Jannah. It's only by Allah's grace and His mercy that any of us will ever see paradise. That's a fact. But because Allah is so generous, so merciful, He's so kind, He's so fair, Everybody, all the humans, will be able to go to that paradise except a few. Those who refuse. And who are the ones that refuse? They're the ones who will deny Allah his right to be worshipped alone without any partners. Allah says in chapter 4 verse 48 of the Quran, Surah An-Nisa, that he does not forgive shirk that you set up partners with him in worship, but anything less than that. He can forgive. What an amazing statement. Talk about salvation. All I have to do is obey the first commandment. The first commandment in the Old Testament in Exodus. The first commandment in the, the, the Old Testament in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Also the commandment which comes with Jesus in Mark 12, 29. Is about knowing that God is one. And you worship him alone with all your heart, all your mind and all your strength. You do that, you'll forgive everything. You'll forgive it all. So this is a test, not for a law, because he already knows the outcome, but it's a test for you and I. We don't know how it's going to come out, but he does. 
So our job is to have the hope for the best. Hope for the best. And always fear for the worst. Keeping ourselves in the middle path. Do that, brother. And don't worry about why Allah does what he does. Worry about why we do what we do. That's the real problem, isn't it? Zafirullah Khair for a good question. Thank you very much, brother, for your question. We take a question from the second mic for the brothers. <clears throat> uh, my name is uh, Pascal. I'm a Christian. I know that Islam and Christianity agree with each other 98 persons. But before, one was regarding the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. If such is the case, I would like to know what made our brother Yusuf uh, to use of us to abuse Islam, living Christianity. I am very keen to know about this fact. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, the questioner would like to know what caused uh, Sheikh Yusuf Estes to become a Muslim after being raised upon Christianity. <laughs> That's a good one. Actually, <laughs> I love these guys. Everybody wants to get in showbiz. <laughs> This is a question we get a lot. Why did you leave Jesus? Why did you turn your back on the Bible? Why have you run away from God? Why have you gone to the terrorists? How come you're with those guys? Ah! I've heard this many times. Many times. Or the simple question, why did you go to Islam? Or how you got to Islam? That comes even from the Muslims. The reality of it, in my particular case, and I'm not telling you about anybody else, I'll just tell you about myself. I was not looking for a new religion. I was very much committed to preaching Christianity. I loved Jesus. I loved him an awful lot. When I got to Islam, I found out how to love him even more because now I know what I'm supposed to say when I say his name. Jesus, alayhi salam, peace be upon him. I also didn't turn my back on the Bible. I spent the next two and a half years sitting with the Bible in Greek, Hebrew, and English in front of me, Quran on the other side, only English in the beginning, later learning the Arabic and comparing and comparing and comparing until finally one day one of the Imams, spiritual leaders for Muslims, he came to me and he said, Sheikh, you are spending all your time with the Bible and comparing and going over everything. Do you know if you spent this much time studying the Tafsir of Quran, you'd be an alim? I said, I didn't think of that. But I did spend a few more years just polishing off my work so I could be sure. And I tell you, without any doubt, and if you want the proof, just let me know. We'll bring it to you by the stack. But if you don't want the proof, don't ask. The proof is clear from the Jewish scholars in all of their publications. And I can name you many, many books from them. And now from the Christian scholars, the same. Stating unequivocally that they no longer have even a copy of now watch this. This is the latest one. It came out last month. Misquoting Jesus. Came out in November. Well, month before last. Came out in November. He said we do not have even a copy of 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 anything original from the Bible. This was Bart Aram. And he is one of the biggest scholars for the Christian religion used to be in the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago and he used to say just like me Bible is the absolute word of God it has no mistake it's this it's that until you examine the real manuscripts and learn what it's really about and then you go whoops somebody been lying to me but then when you go to the Quran in the Arabic language the authentic book 
that's still never been changed in 1400 years and read it in Arabic language and understand the meaning of it and you say Allahu Akbar because why? because when I got through with all of this study by the way I had to be reintroduced to my wife and my children they hardly knew me anymore because I spent all this time but when I got through I can honestly and tell you every single one Christian, Jew and Muslim here today there is no difference in the teachings of these two great three great religions there is nothing contradictory in the Bible and the Quran except where the Bible contradicts itself what I'm telling you is I wanted to be closer to Jesus I wanted to be closer to God I wanted to be closer to salvation and that was my prayer day after day after day and why was Allah guiding me to meet a Muslim I thought God wanted me to convert him and I tried my best until he said these key words I want you to go to the website read all of this because it's far too much to tell you tonight go to yusufestes.com you'll find the whole story why you S-U-F E-S-T-E-S dot com we'll see the whole story but I'll tell you what he said he said after I give him three months worth of Christian dawah he said I will go to your religion if it's better than my religion I'm going hey I got him why well I now knew about Islam a little bit Christianity, you don't have to pray five times a day. You don't have to pass the month of Ramadan. You don't have to pray something called Zakat. You don't have to go to the Holy Land to do any pilgrimage. In fact, you don't even have to be nice if you don't want to. Just say, Jesus died for my sins. But then he said the rest of the sentence. I'll go to your religion if it's better than my religion, but you need proof. I said, what? Proof. Proof, man. <laughs> Religion's not about proof. Religion's about faith. He said, yes, in Islam, we have faith, but we have proof to back it up. Think about that. And then, without realizing what my own mouth was saying, I said, do you mean to sit there and tell me as a Muslim that you can prove there's God? Immediately he responded back. Do you mean to sit there and tell me as a Christian preacher, you can't? Oops. I highly advise anybody who really wants to know the truth to stop worrying about television, newspapers, magazines, and statements from weird people regardless of what they claim their religion is. Just go read the Quran for yourself. See what it says. And then you pray to the one that created you. And ask him. And if you're a Christian, ask. Ask the God that Jesus prayed to. Ask him to guide you to be closer to Jesus like I did. And see what happens. Before we take the next question, I'd like to ask our audience, particularly from the Muslims, you know, if you feel enthused enough to clap, say Alhamdulillah, or Allahu Akbar, or SubhanAllah. Because we don't want to forget that it's all about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not about Shaykh Yusuf, it's not about you or I, it's about Allah Azza wa Jalla. And the clapping can sometimes go to our head, and we start getting up here giving you a dog and pony show, jumping up and down. No. Let's refrain from clapping and praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and at the same time plant some vegetation in Jannah as was mentioned earlier by Shaykh Salim. Alhamdulillah. Our next question please. Please state your name and your occupation. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Akhir, if you could please speak up a little bit. My name is Muhammad Idris. I'm from Kashmir. Wa alaikum salam. I love you. Allah <laughs> May the one for whom you love him also love you. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, those truly fear Allah among his servants who has knowledge. Actually, I tell the people about the Islam, but they are all the intelligent person, intellectuals. They understand and they will convince. 
but there are some non muslims who are poor and not intellectuals how i will explain islam to these types of people which are not uh, intelligent which are not intellectual please explain jazakallah thank you very much for your question the brother is asking that among the non muslim that he knows there are those who are not perhaps as as intellectually aware and maybe they have difficulty in understanding the higher concepts of islam how can he explain islam to them allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the quran 1400 years ago in the arabic language today the majority of the people of the earth know it's some english however a large number of people still know the arabic language but even from them i wouldn't say that they were going to be highly skilled in that particular language so how could we communicate this message especially for those who are not highly educated maybe they don't know three or four languages in fact it's not our duty to educate people to anything more than just this la ilaha illa allah mutahir sabri and myself went to an island off the coast of south america how many years ago 6 or 7 years ago and while we were there we found people that spoke a language called papiamento papiamento Anybody here ever heard of papimento? Huh? No. So what would we do? We focused just on the simplest message of tawhid you can imagine. We went on TV, radio, newspaper, went every possible way we could. We went to the ministry there and the politicians. We walked the streets, talked to the people. In a little over one week, A little over one week, and then on the last day, well, first let me tell you what happened on the first night. First night we went on TV. The next morning, a lady came in and did shahada. He beat me to her, by the way. He got the shahada first. I'm still going to settle that one with you. But anyhow, then in the TV station, when we got done broadcasting, I went and sat in the car. He kept standing there talking to the TV guy. So I'm getting tired. I'm saying, let's go eat, you know. So I walked over to him. And at the time I walked up to him, he was saying to the guy, "Say a shadu." I'm going, "Whoa!" Again with this man. He's too fast. So then, on the last day, the last night, we carefully, slowly explained again our position. There is a God, and this God wants you to worship Him and not what He created. and if you believe that and accept it all you have to do is say these words to get started on your journey la and then i ask the crowd say la ilaha illa allah now if you really mean it and we all stood up and they stood say it again only mean it and they said a shadow and la ilaha illallah shallallahu muhammad rasulullah it's a video on our website it's all over youtube it's on youtube islam if you don't know about youtube islam you can go there and you can see it there or on youtube just type in the word 135 just put the number 135 space islam and you're going to see this is going to pop up you see the video for yourself and watch them so it isn't that hard provided you keep it simple K I S S Keep Islam super simple. Assalamu alaikum. And you and by the way you don't have to clap but you can say Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Jazakumullah khairan. Uh we like to encourage our sisters to follow the footsteps of the ladies of the Ansar, the Sahabia. And we know mashallah Allah has blessed you with a special quality of modesty. 
But oftentimes when the Mashiach come to our towns, the men get all of the attention and the sisters get little to none. So sisters, please, we ask that you step to the mic and we'll be glad to take any questions that you have. The next question we'll take from the sister in the rear. Please state your name and occupation. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. My name is Farhana and I'm working in a bank over here in Chennai. And uh, normally I believe like whatever happens, that happens only with the permission and knowledge of Allah. And I was used to, and uh, I tell all this uh, to my friends. So whatever happens, Allah definitely knows about this. And when uh, Sheikh said regarding September 11th what had happened in U.S., at that uh, time when I was discussing uh, with my friends, they said like, if your Allah knows everything before, why a lot of innocents are lo uh, lost their life on that event? And I was not able to answer that. How can I uh, explain them in those? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your question. The sister asked that if Allah knows everything, why would He allow tragedies like 911 to happen and so many people to lose their life? Is that correct, sister? Please? Exactly. Thank you. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. The question is a good question, one we hear all the time, actually. But if you only zero in on this one event, you make it sound like that's the only bad thing that ever happened. Especially people in the West, they keep talking about, oh, look, almost 2,900 people died on this one day. By the way, did you know 500 of them were Muslims? 500 of the people who died in that tower were Muslims. Yes. Uh-huh. But what about when we have right here in Chennai two years ago, and I was here. I was here in Chennai right after Christmas. And what happened? Anybody remember? I learned a brand new word. It starts with a T, but it, you don't pronounce the T. Tsunami. Tsunami. Is that it? The big wave that came in. And how many people died then? And how many were stranded? And it wasn't just here in India. Man, it was all over those islands, all the way down to... How far away? It was an earthquake or something. And then all these people suddenly are just engulfed in these big waves and they died why didn't they ask me about that why don't you ask about when we have these huge monsoons and so many people die in their villages and you don't ask about that it's the same God isn't it huh I think somebody asking that question is not really dealing with the real world there's plenty of people dying every day. You didn't ask about that. Everybody's going to die. To say that you think there's no God simply because something like that happened really is not to understand what's happening around you all the time, every day. In fact, Allah knew before He created the universe how everything was going to happen, including the end of it. Clearly Allah tells us that all of us will die. Listen what he says. Every person shall taste death. But the important part is when he said this. In the same Quran. O you who believe, have taqwa for Allah as it's his right on you and don't die except in submission surrender obedience sincerity and peace to him yes so you're going to die we already outlined what happened to Sumaya radiallahu anha her husband Yasser radiallahu anha there are many of the companions of Muhammad وسلم, that were slaughtered, they were murdered. Others trying to defend the Muslims and Islam were also killed. 
his uncle Hamza was impaled to the ground with a spear that came in from this side, came out the back between his hips and nailed him to the ground and he couldn't move. None of them sat around and cried about it though, did they? Because they knew that this is not the ultimate life. This is clearly a proof that there has to be some other life, otherwise it wouldn't be fair, would it? It wouldn't be fair that the people who could get away with some of the atrocities that they pull off every single day, they get away with it. Well, innocent men, women, and children are murdered. There has to be a day of judgment, and there has to be a reckoning, and this is not our paradise. For those who want the paradise here, it sounds like that's who you're talking to. People who are saying, well, how come we have a, oh, 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 I, want, uh, I want everything now, I don't want any problem. Huh? Well, Allah will give it to them. The Prophet ﷺ said, A dunya sijnu mu'min wal jannat al kafir. That this life that we all live in every day, in fact, is a prison to a true believer, but it's the only paradise for a disbeliever. Think about that one. And if you'd really like to know how to answer those people, I have a website for you to check this one out. Go to the website called 911bible. 911bible.com. Go check that out and see what it says there. There's a whole lot more, but because this is just question and answer, I'm going to drop it here and, and hope for a chance to get some more questions in. Jazakumullah khair. Well, yeah, alhamdulillah. Uh, next question. We have a question here at the front mic. Yes, sir. Please state your name and occupation. Uh, hello? Hello? No, this, we're going in, sir. Hello? Sir. Hello, everyone. Sorry. My name is Abdul Jabbar. Uh, I'm a software professional. Uh, I love Islam. I, I learn from Islam. Uh, as we all practice the belief, you know that. We all uh, have a belief and practice it. Uh, I'm not a hard believer of Islam. I believe in honesty and struggling to have a legacy of it. Do you encourage me to do that, continue that? How do you converse that? Please explain. If you would please restate the first part of your question again. I love Islam. I'm passionate about learning Islam. Uh, in fact, I've learned a lot of love from Islam. And uh, my belief is different. I, I believe in honesty and have legacy of it. Do you encourage me to do that? Or how do you suggest me? Okay. I'm, I'm having some difficulty understanding clearly. I, yeah, I believe in honesty and have legacy of it. I don't, I mean, I, I love Islam. Yes. I, I, pra I don't practice Islam. Uh -huh. I don't practice Islam. I learn from Islam. How do you encourage me? How do you explain? I mean, how do you suggest me? Any conversation on this? Please, did, uh, did, you, did you understand the question? Or, or are you going to repeat it, repeat it again? Thank you very much. Thank you. Actually, it, what I would like to tell you, yeah, I apologize for not being able to understand the question right away. We're listening with American English ears, and uh, you're probably speaking more British English than we know. But anyway, so thank you. thank you very much. It's a good question. Now, if somebody says that they like things about Islam and what it teaches, but they're not Muslim, it reminds me of what one of our scholars said just a few minutes before I came out here. He, he was laughing with me. And he said, how could it be that somebody said, well, I believe in Allah, but I don't believe the Quran. Or I believe in Muhammad, but I just don't follow what he says. He said, because if you say you believe, that indicates that you're going to do something about it. If you really believe there's God, how could you deny what God says? And if you really believe 
in the way of Prophet Muhammad, then how could you deny? And it's very clear that his sunnah is the best way for a human being to live. Few, few Muslims today really follow the sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Very few. And I'm not saying I'm even one of them. But when you find somebody who really lives the life prescribed for the believer, for the Muslim, for the one who's submitting to God's will, you will find a person that you will be amazed with, as I was 17 years ago. Don't look to the Muslims to find Islam. Look to the teachings of Islam and then try to make yourself be one who does it. Let us quickly look at two things and I'll finish with this. The word Islam is coming from a verb in Arabic, Aslama. It means to do five things. Five. Surrender to him. Submit to him. Obey him. Be sincere with him. And be in peace with whatever he gives you. And if you can do that, then you become a mu Islam. Because in Arabic, when somebody does a verb, you put mu, meme, in front of it. Mu, Islam. If you really want to do what God wants you to do, you're looking for God's will on earth as it is in heaven. The best way to say it in Arabic is Islam. And the one who does it is a Muslim. And it's not for show. And it's not for dough. It's for him. It's between your heart and the one who created you. He gave you your heart. He gave you your inspiration. He gave you your brain. He gives you life every day. He gives you food to eat. He gives you the ability to digest it. He gives you information and the ability to digest that. And all you got to do is thank him instead of what he created. And if you do it, you might be more Muslim than somebody named Abdullah or Abdurrahman or Muhammad between you and him start with that first and pray to him don't pray to something he created if you can see it hear it taste it smell it touch it feel it or imagine it that's not him pray to him just ask him oh God guide me that's my advice for you and that's the advice I've been working on for 17 years but let me help you with it I want to help you say it first in English oh God oh God guide me beautiful now let's say it in Arabic because this is the what he said the the way before there was English in the Quran say eh dina eh dina surat mustaqim eh dina surat mustaqim come on brothers and sisters help him out here eh dina eh dina surat mustaqim eh dina surat mustaqim that's it you're asking Allah now to guide you if you really mean it he'll guide you don't worry don't worry about a thing you don't have to do anything out here for our benefit because it wouldn't matter anyway just do it for for your own benefit with him Jazakumullah khair and now we'll turn it back over to thank Sheikh Muttar and get another good question thank you so much Alhamdulillah my dear brothers and sisters we've been informed that it is time for us to conclude the program I know that there are still some questions remaining uh, if we're going to be here for a few more days, and Chef Yusuf will be glad to to uh, ask any questions that you may have. We have uh, w one gentleman. Uh, that's, we also have a sister at, at the mic too, and we have a brother. So we ask that you email your question to Yusuf at at 99 Islam. Those of you who are not able to ask your questions tonight. Please email Yusuf at 99islam.com. I have a message from the management that the program is over. Yusuf, Y-U-S-U-F at 99, the number 99islam.com. It's now time for us to make salah. Jazakum khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.